after graduate school, um, I applied to become a, an employee with New Mexico State Parks, and I was luckily uh, hired for a, a park law enforcement ranger position uh, that led me on a career for 25 years. And so I'm, I'm proud to be uh, part of the State Parks Division uh, for that period of time. And we're happy that you all were able to have the time to participate with us so that we could provide uh, our presentation on our state parks fees study and resulting proposals. Um, I think it's an important public process for us to be able to provide this virtual session, especially for those of you who might not have been able to attend the in-person sessions that are occurring throughout the state, or for other reasons, maybe homebound and unable to attend in, in person at those meetings. So thank you for taking your time during the middle of the day to come and spend uh, at least an hour and a half with us as we give this presentation. Um, it's important um, for, for New Mexico State Parks. Uh, we're, we started in 1933 um, with, with the State Parks Division as a State Parks Commission. And here we are 91 years later, uh, an important executive agency providing a better quality of life for New Mexicans in the state of New Mexico. And so we're very proud to be a part of that. Um, also, we're proud that we have 35 state parks that occur in 25 of 33 state uh, counties across the state of New Mexico. And so we know that we're a big part of outdoor recreation and the outdoor recreation economy across our state. And we're happy to be having this conversation and we're really looking forward to getting feedback from you all today, as well as in the written uh, comments that we're gonna ask for. Um, thank you all again for uh, having interest in your New Mexico State Parks and the information that we're gonna share. Um, I'm gonna kick it over to our Field Operations Bureau Chief, Jared Langenager. He's gonna guide us through uh, a multi-page presentation that will then eventually be opened up for some question and answer and discussion at the end. Jared, uh, you have the floor, sir. All right, thank you, Toby. Um, as Toby mentioned, my name is Jared Langenegger. I'm the Field Operations Bureau Chief. Uh, we've got about a 45 minute presentation here for you. We'll go through a PowerPoint and kind of explain what we're doing with our rule changes. We'll talk about who we are as a state park division and give you a little bit of background information as far as why we're looking at some of these rule revisions. Um, during the presentation, we have everyone muted. After the presentation, um, we'll open it up to a question and answer session. Um, you're more than welcome to uh, to raise your hand during the session and uh, after the PowerPoint, and we'll answer any questions then. Uh, if you want to enter questions in the in the chat function, you're welcome to do that as well. But those we won't address until after the presentation. So if you'll give me a second here, I will share my screen and get the PowerPoint set up. Okay. So, as, as Toby mentioned, uh, New Mexico State Parks, we are in the process of doing a rules revision. We are looking at amending some of our fees, amending some of the ways that we do things, trying to make the, the division more resilient going forward. In order to understand what we're doing and what we're proposing, we feel it's important that you understand who state parks are and what we do as a division. Probably the most important thing to to know about the division going forward or starting out with is our mission. New Mexico State Park's mission is to protect and enhance natural and cultural resources, provide first class recreational and educational facilities and opportunities and promote public safety to benefit and enrich the lives of our visitors. That's our purpose. That's what we strive to do each and every day out there in our parks. So New Mexico State Parks. We are, we have quite a wide footprint. We're tied to counties and or communities in 25 or 33 counties across the state. Um, we have 35 state parks across the state, encompassing 19 lakes and approximately 192,000 acres of land and water. Uh, 24 of those parks have access for paddlecraft. And we have a significant footprint with over $100 million in fixed assets across the state. We service about 5 million visitors a year, and 70% of New Mexico residents live within 40 miles of a state park. Um, what does that mean? That means that most of the residents of New Mexico have easy access to state parks. We're pretty well spread out. We have locations all across the state, and most New Mexicans live within 40 miles of a park and have easy access. One thing about New Mexico State Parks is we are an enterprise agency. 
as an enterprise agency, we're expected to generate about 75% of our operating budget through self-generated revenues. Um, we're expected to charge fees and raise money through uh, revenues, grants, uh, concession, lease agreements, things of that nature to help offset our operating costs. When you think of New Mexico state parks, you can think of us as kind of small municipalities. Each state park deals with a lot of the same things that municipalities deal with. Um, we deal with public safety. We have our law enforcement officers out in the parks, enforcing our rules, enforcing public safety, assisting visitors. We maintain a wide range of uh, public buildings and facilities. We provide public education and outreach. Um, we work with resource protection, natural resource and cultural resource resources, both. We have a wide range of utilities and infrastructure that we manage. Most of our parks aren't tied into municipal water systems or wastewater systems. Most of our parks across the state uh, operate their own water treatment systems to provide drinking water to the public. Those range from anything from, uh, from wet groundwater wells to surface water treatment where we take water out of the lakes and treat that and distribute it to the public. Uh, most of our parks also deal with uh, their own wastewater. We have several sewage plants across the state that deal with wastewater. We work with public and private business partnerships. Uh, we have a concession program where people are encouraged to operate businesses within state parks. Um, we maintain a significant amount of grounds and roadways across the state. We have a significant uh, fleet of vehicles and equipment, and we also work with economic development in the communities that surround us. What you're looking at here in this slide is the cover of the statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. What this plan is, it's completed every five years. It's called the SCORE, and it outlines recreation friends, needs, and economic impact of outdoor recreation in the state of New Mexico. Um, I mentioned New Mexico State Parks work towards um, economic development in their local communities. Outdoor recreation is a huge contributor to the economy in New Mexico, and State Parks is a leader in that outdoor recreation. Outdoor recreation contributes about $2.4 billion a year to the gross domestic product in New Mexico. It also creates about 35,000 jobs across the state every year. Um, New Mexico is fifth in the country in value-added growth and second for employment growth in the outdoor recreation sector. In order to do all these things, in order to meet our mission and uh, provide the services that we do and operate these parks, we have several needs. Our most important need is our park staff. We can't provide the services that we do without qualified, competent staff and, um, and them being out there every day taking care of things. Unfortunately, parks has been going through some rough times. We've been experiencing some high vacancy rates over the last several years. During the pandemic, we had almost a 50% vacancy rate. Fortunately, we've been able to improve on that some, and we're down to about a 27% vacancy rate. Our efforts to attract and retain qualified staff focus on improving pay and appropriately classifying our employees. Uh, just this last year, we went through a reclassification for our law enforcement staff. Um, previously, our law enforcement staff were classified as natural resource coordinators. We went through a reclassification working with the state personnel office, and they're now classified as park law enforcement officers. What that means is now they're able to receive the same benefits as other law enforcement agencies across the state. Um, they qualify for the law enforcement retirement for things like the law enforcement retention fund and those benefits that they weren't receiving before. Um, it also helps us put them in a little bit higher pay band so we're more competitive with other agencies across the state. Um, we've seen in the past where we lose officers to other sheriff's office, municipal PDs, uh, state police, and having these changes of classifying our employees appropriately, having appropriate pay bands will help us retain those employees and hopefully recruit from some of those other agencies as well. In addition to reclassifying our law enforcement staff, we're working on reclassifying our technical positions. Across state parks, we have several uh, technical positions that uh, are required to have professional licenses for drinking water treatment, uh, wastewater treatment, CDL licenses. All of these things are in high demand. 
uh, those, those, those people are difficult to recruit and retain. So it's important for us to reclassify those positions, make sure they're classified appropriately, make sure we have an appropriate pay band so that we can retain those folks. Um, the most important part of our reclassification, though, is ensuring that we have adequate budget to maintain those higher pay bands and to maintain those, those individuals. Aside from personnel, the largest part of our operating budget goes to our parks maintenance and operations. The largest part of our operations budget is uh, utilities and fuel. With the large footprint that we have, with the uh, wide range of campgrounds, um, facilities, buildings that we have. We have uh, large electric bills, propane, natural gas. Um, we purchase a lot of cleaning supplies to maintain those facilities. All of those things have been going up year over year. Another important thing is that a lot of our infrastructure that we have was installed many years ago. Most parks were built back in the 70s and 80s, and that infrastructure hasn't been updated a lot of it. So as that infrastructure ages, those operation and maintenance costs increase. It's important as that infrastructure is aging to ensure that we do capital improvements and replacement of those systems. Currently, the largest expenditure that we have in our capital improvements is our water and wastewater systems. We have several water systems across the state um, that we're working on replacement right now. We're working on replacing water systems at Conscious, Navajo Lake, um, Heron, El Vado, uh, there's a wide range of water and wastewater systems that are requiring attention. But in addition to those systems, we're also working on roads, parking areas, visitor facilities, and other park facilities as well. As I mentioned earlier, State Parks is an enterprise agency. As an enterprise agency, one of the major ways that we generate revenue is through our State Park user fees. The slide in front of you shows what our current user fees are and the year that they were implemented. Uh, currently, New Mexico State Parks charges a $5 per vehicle day use fee. That fee was implemented back in 2004, and at that time, it was increased from $4 to $5. Um, our camping fees were implemented back in 1998, almost 25 years ago. Um, our current fees for camping, our primitive camping is $8 a night per vehicle. Developed is $10 a night per vehicle. And developed with utility is $14 and full utilities is $18 a night per vehicle. We also have annual passes. We have an annual day use pass and an annual camping pass. Um, our annual day use pass is $40 per year. And then our annual camping pass, um, those range from $100 to $225 depending on whether you're a resident, uh, senior, disabled, or out-of-state visitor. In addition to our entrance fees, New Mexico State Parks relies on boat registration fees to help fund our boating safety program. Um, our boat registration fees were last implemented in 1984, um, almost 40 years ago, and those range anywhere from $28.50 for the smallest vessel, a Class A, which is less than a 16-foot vessel, all the way up to $66 for vessels that are 65 feet and over. So it's important to note that with state parks, while our expenses have increased, our revenue has not. Our fees, as you just saw, have been in place for 25, 40 years, and those have been consistent over those years. Well, you have in front of you here is a slide showing um, a little bit of inflation, um, just like everybody out there, every household out there has been dealing with inflation, paying higher bills for your fuel electric state parks has that same issue. Um, so a little bit of comparison to kind of look at what uh, costs were back in 85 when uh, 84, 85, when boat registration fees were in place. Uh, gasoline averaged dollar 12 a gallon. Currently we're averaging 306 a gallon. Uh, to purchase a Ford F-150 back then, which is the vehicle that we use mostly in our parks, cost uh, $10,591. Currently, we're paying about $43,000 for those vehicles. It's no surprise to anyone, else, anyone out there that uh, costs are going up. Um, the important thing that we'd like to emphasize is that while costs have gone up, our fees and our revenues have not increased. 
Um, this slide here shows what our state park budget was back in fiscal year 2010 to current. Um, the reason I went back to 2010 and not back to 1985 is the information on this slide comes from the New Mexico Sunshine Portal. The New Mexico Sunshine Portal is a public website that the state operates where anybody can go log on to it and uh, look up budget information for any of the parks, any of the divisions in the state, the state in general. You can look up uh, employee salaries. You can look up any anything that is fiscal uh, about the state. You can look it up on that site. Um, so the numbers from that site go back to 2010, and I wanted to have information that people can fact check for us. When you look at the state park budget in 2010, it was just over $29 million. It was $29,377,000. Our current budget for fiscal year 24 is just under $29 million at $28,929,000. When you look at the state budget as a whole, back in 2010, it was $9,600,000,000. Uh, 2024 is just over $18,000,000. When you look at comparable agencies like New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, uh, their budget back in 2010 was 38 million up to 52 million this year. Uh, New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs, Museums and Monuments Division uh, back in 2010 was 27 million up to 36 million this year. So I think the thing that we're trying to emphasize here is I don't know of any other, any other agency out there, any other business, any other household that has operated for the last 15 years on a flat or less than flat budget and still operates the same amount of things that they did back then. And in fact, New Mexico State Parks is operating more than we did back then because since 2010, we've added three parks, including Cerritos Hills State Park, Mesilla Valley Bosque State Park, and Pecos Canyon State Park, which is our newest state park. Uh, this is just a graph showing how our operating budget has changed over the years since 2010. Again, this information came off the Sunshine Portal. Uh, you can see that after 2010, we took a dip down uh, close to 20 million uh, from 30 million. Uh, that drop in 2022 was because of the pandemic and us not bringing in enough revenue there. When we had our parks closed, that's kind of an anomaly, but we are on the upward trend, but we're still not back to where we were in 2010. So we mentioned that as an enterprise agency, state parks generates about 75% of our operating budget. Um, this chart shows the last five years of where our budget comes from. Um, that first part there talk, shows the general fund. We get about 25% of our budget from the general fund. We also receive some funding from federal funds. We have federal grants, like I mentioned, our boat safety grant, um, some other grants there. And then we have our other funds, which includes our visitation revenue, our park entry fees. It includes our concession revenue. And it also includes things that we have leases for and, and a bit of other revenue there. When you look at our park entrance fees as a percentage of our total revenue, they make up about 20% of our total revenue. Um, on average, we get about uh, one and a half billion from day use fees and uh, about three and a half million from camping fees. Um, camping fees make up the large majority of, of the revenue that we receive from entrance fees. Of course, our revenue fluctuates along with visitation. In the chart here, it shows our revenue and visitation uh, for the past five years from 2019 to current. You can see that uh, we took a pretty hard hit during the pandemic, our visitation and revenue dropped. Of course, we had to close several parks during that time. But fortunately, since the pandemic, the public seems to have reconnected with New Mexico State Parks and the outdoors, and they're getting out and enjoying the outdoors more. Um, we've seen an increased visitation to over 5 million visitors every year since 2022, and we would expect that to continue going forward. Um, so while we are an enterprise agency, parks never produce enough revenue to be fully self-supporting. Um, our goal is to be as self-supporting as possible. In fact, most parks spend more than we bring in with revenue, with the exception of some of our larger parks. 
This chart here shows each individual park. It shows their revenue, their expenditures, and visitation on average. Uh, actually, this is for fiscal year 2023, so last fiscal year. Um, some of our larger parks like Navajo and Elephant Butte uh, do bring in a little bit more than what they expend, but they have the benefit of having uh, uh, large concessionaires in those parks that include marinas, uh, things of that nature that help generate a substantial amount of revenue. On the other end of the spectrum, we have parks like Living Desert. Uh, that's our zoo down in, in Carlsbad, New Mexico. They provide a critical educational component and resource protection component, but they don't bring in nearly the amount of revenue needed to be self-sufficient. So we try and balance across the system and ensure that parks as a whole brings in as much revenue as we can to be self-supporting across the system. The majority of our budget, just like any other organization, goes to personnel. Um, however, unlike most other organizations, New Mexico State Parks is not top heavy. Of our 190 positions, only 27 are located in our Santa Fe administrative office. The rest of our positions are out in the field, out in the parks, working with the public day in and day out. Um, that equates to about 14% of our, our personnel are in Santa Fe. The other 86% are, are out in the field, working with visitors, providing the services that we provide. When you look at our personnel budget in New Mexico State Parks, our current personnel budget for fiscal year 2024 is right around $14 million. As I mentioned, we have a significant vacancy rate. Um, if you looked at our budget and our positions that we have vacant, if all of our positions were currently filled at midpoint, we would need closer to $20 million to have all of those positions filled. So with our current budget, we're not going to be able to fill all of, our, all of our positions. What that means is that we have to operate with, uh, with uh, looking at which positions we hire, which positions we don't. We have to make decisions on leaving certain positions vacant in order to meet the budget that we have in place. When parks are operating with significant staff shortages, it creates a decline in the services that we can provide. It makes it more difficult for state parks to meet our mission. You might ask, why do we need more personnel? Why do we have to have personnel? If we're operating right now with a 27% vacancy rate, and parks are open, you can go out and go boating in Elephant Butte. You can go hiking in Cerritos Hills. Why do we need to fill those positions? Well, the important thing is we're not maintaining our mission right now. We're not opening all of our areas right now. We've been operating by closing certain areas where we don't have staff. We've had to maintain closures at parks like uh, Conscious at Brantley Lake State Park. We've had large campgrounds that have been closed because we don't have the staff to operate them and maintain them the way that they need to be maintained. You might ask, why do areas need to be maintained? There are several recreational options in New Mexico that are outdoor recreation options where you can go and not have um, uh, park rangers there. You can go out in the forest, BLM lands, things like that. The thing that you run into when areas are not properly managed is we experience resource impacts, public, sleep, public, public safety issues, and degradation of the overall experience for visitors. What you see in this slide are a couple of pictures of Pecos Canyon State Park before it became a state park. Um, the, the area was open to the public. People could go there and recreate. But what happened is um, the area kind of got tore up, trash got left everywhere. So the local community, local legislators in the area pushed for state parks to take on operation of Pecos Canyon State Park. Um, we now manage it. These areas are, are better maintained. We have regular trash service, regular maintenance, and um, operated just like our other state parks. Matter of fact, we receive requests on a regular basis for parks to take on outdoor recreation areas because of the work that we do in making sure that the areas are clean, that they're safe and available for the public. The other thing that we have to look at in addition to protecting the resource is having parks appropriately staffed ensure protection of the public. 
What's showing on the screen now is something that happens on a regular basis almost every weekend at our lake parks. These rangers are towing in a stranded vessel. Uh, people run out of gas. They have mechanical issues, things of that nature. And we're out there, our staff are, to pull them in and help them on the lake. Unfortunately, sometimes it's a little bit uh, more serious than a stranded vessel. While we've been short staff, we've experienced situations where park rangers have had to travel over an hour to respond to critical situations such as drownings because the park where the situation occurred didn't have staff there. That's unacceptable to us. We need to make sure that our parks have staffing, have people there to help uh, protect the public and respond to those situations. So now that we've given you an overview of uh, how parks operate, kind of what we do, what our mission is and what our goals are, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our actual fee study and recommendations. So over the past several years, New Mexico State Parks has been working to improve our fees. Um, we, we revised our fee study back in January of 2023, started working on it, um, finalized it in July of 2023 and presented it to our administration for approval. And now we're going forth and uh, proposing rule amendments and uh, having these public informational meetings, getting public input so that we can finalize what our plan will be going forward. So for our fee study, we looked at surrounding states. We looked at uh, Nevada, we looked at Utah, Colorado, Texas and Arizona, we looked at their state park systems to see how they operate and the fees that they charge. We also looked at how inflation would have impacted our fees. We looked at, you know, when our fees were implemented, what they would be currently if we looked at inflation. The first fees that we looked at were day use fees. And in New Mexico State Parks, we charge $5 per vehicle for a day use fee. Um, that's for somebody to go into the park during the day, go picnicking, go fishing, boating, things of that nature, not for staying overnight. In Arizona, they charge between $7 and $30 per vehicle. Each park in Arizona has different entrance fees. At Colorado, they charge $10 per vehicle. In Nevada, they charge $5 to $10 per vehicle. In Texas, they charge $2 to $8 per person. Um, they don't charge by vehicle, they charge by each individual person entering the park. Um, and then in Utah, they charge between $5 and $15 per vehicle. When you look at these fees, uh, Nevada and Utah, and Utah both charge differential rates for residents and non-residents. They charge non-residents a little bit higher fee. The next thing we looked at was primitive camping fees. Uh, when you think about primitive camping fees, what that means is somebody camping along the shoreline at Elephant Butte, somebody camping at Mine Canyon and Butte Lake. It's uh, camping where um, we don't have a table, we don't have a grill, it's not a developed site. Um, so right now, New Mexico State Parks charges $8 per night uh, for primitive camping, and that's a per vehicle charge. In Arizona, they charge $15 to $25 per night. In Colorado, they charge $14 to $18 per night. In Nevada, they charge $15 to $18 per night. In Texas, it's $5 to $15 per night. And in Utah, it's $10 to $15 per night. One thing to note here is that in Colorado and Texas, in addition to their camping fees, they charge the entrance fee as well. So whatever the entrance fee is for that park that you're visiting, you pay that, and then you pay the camping fee on top of that. The next thing we looked at is our developed camping fees. In New Mexico, we charge $10 per night per vehicle for developed camping. We charge a utility fee on top of that. There's a $4 fee for electric and a $4 fee for sewer. Uh, we don't currently charge for water. In Arizona, they charge between $15 and $50 per night for developed camping. Colorado is between 22 and 41. Nevada is 14 to 30. Texas is 12 to 25, and Utah is 15 to 40. And there again in Colorado and Texas, they charge the day use fee in addition to camping fees. 
So in order to better compare costs to some of these other state park systems, we went and made mock reservations at some of their parks. Um, and what we did is we made a reservation for somebody with a full hookup site, um, staying for three nights, a full hookup with water, electric, and sewer for an RV site. When you do that at uh, Crawford State Park in uh, Colorado, the total for that weekend stay comes out to $133.46. When you do that at Cedar Hill State Park in Texas, the total comes out to $150. That same site at uh, Lake Havasu in Arizona comes out to $123.20. And uh, Escalante Petrified Forest State Park in Utah, it comes out to $188. We also looked at uh, private campgrounds around the state of New Mexico. We looked at some KOAs around the state. At Raton, that same site would be $180. Uh, Carlsbad KOA is $225. Las Cruces KOA is $315. And Las Vegas KOA is $215. When you make the same reservation at uh, New Mexico State Parks at Caballo Lake State Park, the fee is $54 for the site, $12 for the reservation fee for a total of $66. We're, we're quite a bit behind other states in what we charge for, for our camping sites. In addition to looking at our entrance fees, we compared uh, vessel registration fees to other states. One thing to note is in New Mexico, we charge our vessel registration fee based on a three year cycle. And uh, not every every state does that. In Texas, they charge it based on a two year cycle. Arizona, Colorado, and Utah, or, or Colorado and Nevada are based on a one year cycle. So what we did to make, to, com to make an accurate comparison is we divided out our three year cost and got a one year cost. And then Texas, we divided out their two year cost and got a one year cost. That way we can compare apples to apples and and see what the comparison is accurately so in new mexico like we mentioned um, your class a vessel a 16 foot or less vessel is 2850 for three years or 950 a year texas that same vessel would be 16 dollars a year arizona would be 22 dollars a year colorado 35 25 a year and nevada between 20 and 25 dollars per year Utah, we really couldn't make an accurate comparison to because Utah charges their registration fees based on the value of the vessel, not on the size of the vessel. In addition to comparing to other states, we looked at our fees and what they would be based on inflation. To do this, we looked at the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics CPI inflation calculator. You can look that up on uh, on the on their website, and you can enter you know a dollar today or a dollar ten years ago and see what the inflation rate is. So for our day use, we looked at uh, comparison from January 2004 to December of 2022, and that inflation rate showed a cost going from five dollars to $8.01. Our primitive camping, uh, developed camping utility charge, we looked at a comparison from 98 to December of 2022. And so our primitive would go from $8 to 1469, developed from 10 to 1837, and the utility charge from four to 735. We also looked at inflation at uh, Living Desert Zoo and Gardens at the fees there. They charge a per person entrance fee at the zoo, um, not a per vehicle fee. And we looked at those fees from January 2024 to July of 2023. And so the, the adult fee of $5 went from $5 to $8.25. The child fee of $3 went to $4.95. When we look at the vessel registration fees based on inflation, um, the class A goes from $28.50 to $83.67. Uh, class one goes from 36 to 105. Class two goes from 43.50 to 127.70. Class three from 51 to 149. Um, and then 65 feet and over goes from 66 to 
193.77. The reason there are such large increases there is that's 40 years of inflation that we're looking at. Um, that's based on using the inflation calculator from January 1984 to January of 2023. In addition to looking at our fees and uh, vessel registrations, we looked at our annual passes. In New Mexico State Parks, we have annual camping passes that are available to uh, New Mexico residents and non-residents. When you look at our annual camping passes, we sell about 3,500 annual camping passes per year. That generates about $500,000 worth of revenue for the state. Um, most of our annual camping passes go to resident seniors. About 1,500 of those passes go to resident seniors, about 820 to residents, about 189 to resident disabled, and then about 827 to non-residents. It's important to note when we're looking at annual camping passes that New Mexico is one of only four states still offering an annual camping passes. Most other states have figured out that it's a bad operational decision. The other states that still offer it are Kansas, Wyoming, and Nevada. They operate their annual camping passes a little bit differently. Um, Kansas and Wyoming only offer them to in-state residents. The Kansas annual camping pass does not cover utility fees or prime site fees. It's only for certain, certain sites that are not prime sites. Um, Wyoming, they have to pay a park entrance fee on top of their annual camping pass, and it does not guarantee reservations. Nevada is probably the closest to us. They offer in-state, out-of-state annual camping passes, and they operate similar to us. Um, as I mentioned, only New Mexico and Nevada now allow non-residents to purchase the annual camping pass. So what we found is with the annual camping pass, um, it, it causes several issues operationally for New Mexico State Parks. Um, we found that annual camping passes tend to reduce access to high demand sites. What you're looking at here is a video showing the shoreline of Elephant Butte on a busy holiday weekend. What we've noticed is ACPs have been used by campers to save sites at busy parks by parking their camping unit in place for extended periods of time, a week before the holiday weekend, and then not using the site, but just going back for the weekend. So they're blocking off that site and taking up space that another camper could use. We've also noticed issues with annual camping passes being used to make multiple reservations. Um, people have used their annual camping pass to reserve, say, at Elephant Butte, Navajo Lake, Ute Lake, all for the same weekend, and then as time gets closer to that weekend, they'll decide which park they go to. Um, this causes uh, uh, the sites to be tied up and unavailable for people that might actually use those sites. The other thing that we've noticed is the ACPs have a tendency to encourage non-recreational use of state parks. Um, if you go on Google and you look up New Mexico State Parks annual camping pass, You'll find several videos talking about how cheap it is to live in New Mexico State Parks by using the annual camping pass. Um, there are several YouTube channels, uh, a lot of different videos out there encouraging people to live in New Mexico State Parks for only $225 a year for the out-of-state camping pass. While, while it's great that uh, people can get uh, portable uh, uh, housing, that's not New Mexico State Parks mission. Our mission is to promote outdoor recreation, not provide affordable housing options. Having people reside in New Mexico State Parks places an undue burden on the state parks and prevents those wanting to recreate from accessing popular sites. So with looking at all these different options and looking at all these, the states, the inflation or annual camping pass, we came up with several recommendations. And this chart in front of you outlines our recommendations. I'll go through each of them uh, individually. We started out with our, our day use pass for New Mexico residents. Currently it's $5 per vehicle and we're proposing making day use for New Mexico residents free. 
Now, I just got done going through a whole presentation talking about how New Mexico State Parks needs additional revenue, how we need additional budget to ensure that we can operate and hire personnel. But now I'm telling you that uh, New Mexico State Parks wants to make day use free for residents at a cost of about $160,000 a year. That doesn't necessarily make sense, or it seems counterintuitive. But really, what New Mexico State Parks is trying to do with this is we're trying to create long-term users. We're trying to provide equitable access to all New Mexico residents to outdoor recreation. There are several studies showing how outdoor recreation provides health benefits, mental health benefits, community building benefits. It's a quality of life issue. We want to ensure that a $5 day use fee is not an impediment to people coming out to New Mexico State Parks. Um, we also have seen, and other states have seen nationwide, an issue with um, what's called outdoor deficit disorder. Um, kids, people not getting outdoors, not enjoying the resource, but looking at a screen. And that's an issue for us going forward because if people aren't enjoying the outdoors, if we're not introducing people to state parks, then we're not building those long term clients. Those long term visitors are going to be with us for years to come. So we're hoping that by eliminating the day use fee and eliminating any impediment to people getting out into state parks, we build long term users. Um, we, we looked at increasing non resident day use to help offset this cost. We're proposing charging a $10 per vehicle fee rather than a $5 vehicle fee for day use for non-residents. Um, we're also proposing increasing some of our camping fees. As I mentioned earlier, camping is where we make the majority of our revenue through our user fees. Uh, currently, our primitive camping fee is $8 per vehicle. Our developed camping fee is $10 per vehicle. We're proposing going to a flat camping fee of $20 per vehicle. When people are in the parks, um, primitive camping, they still have access to our restrooms, shower facilities, playgrounds, boat ramps. Um, they still have the park rangers providing public security, uh, providing those resources. Um, really, there's not a location in New Mexico State Parks where you're boondocking like you would be in a forest or on BLM land. So we feel that it, it makes sense to combine those two and just charge a $20 per vehicle camping fee. For our utility fees, we're looking at going from $4 per day to $10 per day. Um, that's a per utility fee. Like I say, right now we charge for electric and sewer, but we don't charge for water. We're proposing charging for water going forward. Um, as I mentioned, uh, maintaining our water systems, maintaining that infrastructure, uh, maintaining the operators for those systems is a significant expense. We feel that implementing a fee for using that service uh, makes sense. It doesn't make sense for others to subsidize somebody getting water. Um, they should be paying for that fee and uh, incurring that cost. We're proposing implementing a dump station fee. Currently, our dump stations are free for our visitors. We're proposing implementing a $10 per use fee for our dump stations. Um, our annual day use pass, we're proposing eliminating that. If New Mexico residents have access to our parks for free day use, um, then we feel that there's not a need to have the annual day use pass. The annual camping pass, we are proposing eliminating based on the information that we provided in the earlier slides. When you look at the information on this table, it shows a, a deficit or a loss in revenue there. But we actually feel that if people are paying per camping visit, there should be an increase in revenue um, rather than paying for the full year at once. At Living Desert, we're proposing increasing our entrance fee from uh, the low end 50 cents per visitor to a dollar and the high end $5 to $10 per visitor. Our vessel registration fees, we're proposing increasing uh, from $28.50 on the low end to $75 and $66 on the high end to $180. And that again would be for a three year period, not for an annual cost. That's every three years. 
Right now, um, in New Mexico State Parks, we don't have a fee for paddle craft or non motorized vessels to launch. Um, currently, our boating safety program, our boat operations program, is funded by our boat registration fees. And we use those fees to match a Coast Guard grant that's a 50 50 grant. Um, we feel that the folks that are using paddle craft, We'd like to implement a launch fee for those so that they're helping contribute to that system. Uh, people that are launching paddle craft are still benefiting from the facilities that we have, our boat docks that are out there, our rangers on the water. Uh, they're still getting that assistance out there, but they're not paying into the system. The other thing that we're noticing statewide is an increase in paddle craft users and a decrease in motorized vessel users. So, in order to sustain our boat operations going forward in our boat safety program, it's important that we keep up with that. Uh, the last fee that I have to talk about is a uh, parking fee at Rio Grande Nature Center. So, currently, um, New Mexico State Parks Rio Grande Nature Center is, is operated a little bit differently. They charge a $3 fee right now. We're proposing going to a $5 fee. And the reason we're proposing maintaining a fee at Rio Grande Nature Center and not the other parks is Rio Grande Nature Center is located downtown Albuquerque next to the Bosque. Um, if we don't have a fee there, we'll see an increase in visitors that aren't necessarily going to the park, but using it as a parking lot to access other areas surrounding it. Um, so to ensure that people actually parking there are using the park, we feel it's important and the Staff there feel it's important to implement a parking fee of some sort. We've set that cost at $5. The other part of our fees recommendations and our rule change recommendations going forward is to amend our rule to require New Mexico State Parks to revise our fees or review our fees every five years. Um, so, as you notice, there's some large jumps on here. Um, a lot of our fees haven't been increased in many years. Camping fees haven't been increased in 25 years. Boat registration fees haven't been increased in 40 years. We feel that by adding a requirement in rule to require the division to evaluate our fees every five years based on inflation and make incremental increases going forward, that that will be better and um, help, help us not have these, these large increases in the future. So we're going to provide an example here of our current versus our proposed fees. So this is if John Smith takes his family camping to Cabello Lake State Park. They stay in a site with full hookups for three days. What's it cost for the weekend? Currently, the developed camping fee is $10 a night for three nights is $30. The electric hookup is $4 a night for three nights is $12. Um, the water hookup is free and the sewer hookup currently is uh, $4 a night, three nights at $12 for a total of $54. Under the proposed fee structure, uh, the camping fee would be $20 per night for three nights would be $60, uh, $10 a night for each utility. So it'd be 30 for each one of those for a total of $180 for the weekend. When you look at this fee compared to surrounding states, um, Colorado is 133.46, Texas 150, Arizona 123.20, and Utah 188. New Mexico at 180 would be towards the higher end, but what we're trying to do here is ensure that we get the fee set right so we're not having to increase it right away and we're sustainable going forward. It's also important to note that some of these other states have not done a recent fee increase. So they're a little bit behind on inflation as well. So with this increase in revenue and with these new fees, what we'd be looking to do is improve our recruitment and retention. We mentioned reclassifying our positions, being able to pay a little bit better, ensure that we're able to retain staff going forward, make sure we have the appropriate staff to operate our parks appropriately. We're looking at improving our operating budgets, making sure that we're able to pay fuel costs, maintenance costs. Uh, we're able to provide the supplies that we need to maintain the parks adequately. 
we're looking at improving our fleet management. Currently, the way that we purchase fleet, uh, purchase new vehicles, new equipment, we wait for a capital request from the legislature or we wait for um, a grant to come in. Um, improving our budget would allow us to set aside money on an annual basis so that we could maintain and improve our fleet going forward and have a better fleet management um, strategy. This would also help us to improve park modernization. What you're looking at here is a solar grid that was set up at Hyde Memorial State Park. That park is operated entirely off grid. It's operated off the solar system. It provides electrical to our campground, to our visitor center, to the lodge. Um, and most of our parks have solar systems set up to offset utility costs. We also are looking at park modernization systems with uh, fee collections. We're currently working on developing uh, kiosks for our parks where we can have automated fee collection. People can come up, punch in on the screen what they want, swipe their card, and have it be more convenient for our visitors. And then we also, um, while we're not looking at this funding, this increase in revenue to provide capital improvements, it does provide for staffing that manage those capital improvements. It provides for funding that can be used to offset federal grants, things of that nature to help us improve our facilities going forward. So our timeline for the implementation of our fees, um, as we mentioned, we, we started our fee study back in January of 2023. We completed our fee study in July of 2023, presented it to our administration for approval. We received the approval to go forward. We're conducting informational meetings from December through March. Um, we have this virtual meeting today. Uh, next week, we'll be holding a public meeting on the 6th in Tucumcari, on the 7th in Las Vegas. The following week, we'll be holding a public meeting at Navajo Lake State Park on the 11th, uh, at Rio Grande Nature Center on the 12th. Um, and through this process, we're hoping to inform the public, gather recommendations, gather input. Uh, we published our rule change in the New Mexico Register, and we're taking public comment up through March 29th. On April 1st, we will hold our official rules hearing. Through that hearing, we'll determine how we move forward. And our goal is to implement final change on July 1st, but that's not a set deadline. Um, that depends on the recommendations that we receive. That depends on what our, our final um, outcome is. Through this process, one thing that's important to realize is this is not something that's set in stone. Anytime we do a rule revision, we look for public comment. As we're receiving public comment, we'll review that and may make revisions. So our public comment period is up through March 29th. Our rule hearing is on April 1st. After that point, we'll determine what, our, what we're going to do going forward. If we make significant changes, we'll likely have another comment period and another rule hearing. So, as we mentioned, this is a rule change process. Anytime that you're opening a rule to make changes, it's important to look at the rest of the language in there and see if there's anything else that needs to be amended. In, in doing this process, we recognize that uh, we need to clarify checkout times for campsites. Uh, we need to include Cerritos Hills as a park that does not allow camping. It's a day use park. Um, we're clarifying language in our rule to allow the official use of off highway motor vehicles or agencies that assist us like the Department of Game and Fish, State Police, those agencies. We're clarifying language to allow the use of off highway motor vehicles by concessionaires in some areas. We're removing the allowance for off highway motor vehicles on ice fishing lakes. Um, so in New Mexico state parks, we generally prohibit the use of off highway motor vehicles in state parks um, with two exceptions. One of those exceptions is for an ADA request, an accommodation request. People can request to use an off highway motor vehicle as an ADA request. Um, the other exception is at Eagle Nest Lake State Park. We have an exception in rule for people to use off highway motor vehicles. 
to get from the boat ramp onto the lake surface during ice fishing. Uh, when the lake is frozen over, people are currently allowed to use off high water vehicles to go ice fishing. Uh, this is a rule that's kind of been held over from when the game and fish managed the lake. What we found is that the lake surface at Eagle Nest, uh, when it freezes over, the ice isn't always consistent. We regularly have pressure ridges across the lake that present hazards. We can have um, strong, solid, clear ice, 18 to 24 inches at one part, but at these pressure ridges, it becomes weak. There can be open water and they present hazards. The last two years that we had uh, the lake open for ATVs and OHVs, we had two ATV and OHVs go through the ice. And uh, fortunately, no one was injured. Um, those people were able to self rescue and get assistance. But uh, we feel that given the unreliability, the pressure ridges in the lake, um, we need to just remove that and not allow uh, highway motor vehicles on the lake surface. Um, we're removing the exception for fees to the conscious concession. So in our rule currently, there's an exception saying if you go to the store at Conscious Lake State Park and you're just going to the store and leaving, you don't have to pay our day use fee. There's no longer a store at Conscious Lake State Park, so there's no need to have that in our rules anymore. Uh, we're looking at removing the Veterans Day Use Pass. Um, currently, New Mexico State Parks offers a Veterans Day Use Pass for all New Mexico veterans that are 50% or more disabled. If we amend the rule to allow free day use for all New Mexico residents, veterans will be covered under that as well, and there would be no need, them, no need for them to have a pass hanging in their vehicle. They would still receive the free day use to parks. Uh, they just wouldn't need to have the pass to get into, into the parks. We'll still be maintaining our, our current program of providing veterans with three free camping nights, um, that's not going to change. We're also uh, looking at amending the language for foster family free access. We have a program there where foster families get free access um, and free camping. Uh, that changed a little bit with some legislation from uh, the previous legislative session. So we need to amend our rule to match that legislation. We're also looking at eliminating reference to wildlife blind fees. Uh, currently, we have in our rule uh, fees set up for renting wildlife blinds overnight. Unfortunately, in New Mexico State Parks, we don't have any wildlife blinds, so we're, we're removing that language. We're proposing adding a short-term concession permit. Currently, in New Mexico State Parks, if you want to sell something in the park, uh, conduct business in the park, you have to apply for a concession permit. That's an annual permit. Um, a lot of times in parks, we'll have events like balloon regattas, uh, things like that. Um, we've had folks approach us wanting to do craft fairs in the parks where people can sell crafts. They're not allowed to do that currently unless they have a full year concession permit. What the addition of a short term concession permit would do is it would allow us to have somebody come in, say for a craft fair, have a permit for a short term period, five days, and not have to go through the full uh, year permit process to get that. And then of course, anytime you open up a rule, um, you'll find spelling grammatical errors and we're fixing some of those going forward. So with that, um, this slide shows uh, where comments can be made to. Um, this meeting is an informational meeting. Um, we're, we're providing information. We're asking that all comments please be provided to us in writing. Um, that way they can be a part of the official record for our rules revision process. Uh, you can do that by mailing it to the address there or by sending us an email. Um, the QR code there will take you to our website and that has all the information on there. It has our rule study that we, our fee study that we did. It has our executive summary. It has our, uh, this slideshow on there. If you'd like to go through the slideshow and find it on there. It has all of the comments that have been provided to this point. Um, it has all the information related to our rules revision process. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and 
stop sharing the PowerPoint and we will go to questions. Maybe we can the chat questions first. Yeah, we'll we'll go to the chat questions first. Let's see here. Seems like there's quite a few of them in here. So there's a question, can this be published? People look at offline, absorb slowly. Yes, it's on our website. Uh, if you follow that QR code, it'll take you to our website in the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you, Wendy, for providing that answer on there. Just say who Wendy is. Uh, Wendy is our uh, marketing manager. She does all of our outreach uh, press releases and all the marketing that uh, we do. So Paige says Texas actually charges per vehicle. Uh, the information that we have from Texas uh, shows a per person charge. Uh, the per vehicle charge may be for their camping fees. Uh, for reference, one tenth of a point. Okay, I'm guessing that's RV rates. Thank you for that information, Maggie. Um, Steve Harrington, then why don't you fix the reservation system to allow sites to be canics, oh, canceled for no shows and open them back up? Have we ever counted how many reserve sites are not in use because there is no way to reclaim unused reservations? They do that in Arizona. That's that's a good comment, Steve. So we do have the ability to cancel reservations if somebody doesn't show up if they're not there uh, 24 hours after their reservation deadline. The reason that that's not being done currently is we don't have the staff to manage for that. So um, we're working at, at getting that, we have that ability, um, and hopefully as we, we fix our vacancy rate and hopefully as we bring more staff on, we can manage that a little bit better. Uh, I think having a, a system where our reservation system can manage for annual camping passes would help us as well. Unfortunately, right now we can't do that because we sell annual camping passes at every park across the state. And the only way for our reservation system to manage annual camping passes where they wouldn't be able to make multiple reservations is for all of our annual camping passes to be sold only by our reservation provider. So hopefully that answers that question. So, yes, charging for water, that totally optional things that humans are known for going without for long periods of time with zero repercussions. Seriously, this is a terrible idea and the total utility fee increase doesn't even cover the loss from the extremely low day use fee, much less the day use and annual day use pass. Okay, um, so with the utility fees, we're not necessarily looking to offset the day use loss. Um, and one important thing to note, whenever you look at that slide on the utility fees, um, most of the information in that slide, looking at what our revenue would be or wouldn't be, is, is uh, an estimation. Uh, we don't have an accurate number of how many people use utilities every year. We don't track that information currently. So we put an estimated number in there just to track that. For people who own property in New Mexico and spend several months at a time visiting state parks, but don't have driver license, their New Mexico driver license, your elimination of annual passes is detrimental. So in regards to that, our annual pass um, we're, we're eliminating, the way that we are going to be verifying um, resident status for entrance into a park is you can either provide a New Mexico driver's license or a New Mexico registered vehicle. So if somebody that comes in that owns property and spends months here has a New Mexico registered vehicle and they drive that into the park, that will uh, verify or qualify them for the free day use under the rule revision the way we have it. Wanting paddlers to pay their share for education initiatives, safety and infrastructure would only be subsidizing motorized user users. In 2023, state parks held zero paddling education events, 
but over 30 voter safety edge courses, which are almost entirely motor vote specific. The one of 67 course modules that relates to paddlecraft is a combination of false information regarding paddlecraft accident statistics, belittling paddlecraft users as ignorant and only existing as hazards to motorized users, and offers no constructive education for paddlers other than seek professional instruction elsewhere. Regarding safety and enforcement, here are the real statistics according to the U.S. Coast Guard's 2022 boating accident safety report. Less than 6% of all reported boating accidents involve non-motorized craft. The top five contributing elements of all reported boating accidents are motorcraft specific. Boating fatalities are over 75% motorboat related and boating injuries are 97% motorboat related. For infrastructure, paddlecraft users require no specific infrastructure, nor is there any paddlecraft specific infrastructure currently available in New Mexico State Parks. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give Jared a break. Uh, this is Toby. And so that's that's a great comment and we appreciate that thread of information. And that's precisely why we are considering this uh, as part of our proposals. We get feedback from paddlecraft users across the state Obviously, this is an emer has been an emergency uh, uh, emergent uh, use of recreation, outdoor recreation across the country, as well as in our state. And we're we're getting those those interests. Um, you know, why don't we have more put in sites and takeout sites that are specific and and uh, designed for paddlecraft users? And so we have at certain parks like Morphy Lake State Park, as well as Sugary Canyon State Park. Uh, began implementing docks that are specific for paddlecraft users. This funding, if it's generated in, in how it's being proposed or whatever it will turn out to be at the end of this process, would be specifically earmarked in order to continue to improve paddlecraft oriented access um, across the areas where paddlecraft exists in state parks. And so, you know, it's trying to generate a revenue that's based on a user user pay user benefits scenario, which most state park fees across the country, as well as ours are built on. And so that there is not a competition between motor boats and paddle craft and that paddle craft have to use what is predominantly motor boat areas so that we can start to create some specific uh, and more uh, supportive paddle craft options across the state. And so, um, that that's that's something that we're we're wanting to do as we move forward. Thank you, Toby. Um, next question I see is how much is the vessel launch fee for motorized craft? Uh, there is not a vessel launch fee for motorized craft. Um, motorized craft pay a registration fee, and as I mentioned, that registration fee is used to match our Coast Guard grant to provide. Uh, the services that we offer. You just doubled my camping expense with no consideration for disabled or senior citizens, senior citizens on fixed budgets. Okay, um, Steve, um, I'll go ahead and answer that. Please, that's a great comment, and and it's not a, a comment that we haven't heard in other uh, public meetings that we've held up until this point. Steve, I, I would just ask you, please send us what you think would be reasonable. Um, we need that information um, as of day before yesterday through the process that we've had with public meetings. We had approximately 260 comments, almost 300 comments that we're asking the public to provide. And that's that's going to be very valuable. But what we what we're asking is just don't say no to our proposals. Give us better options. Give us strategies. Give us from the user perspective what you all think is more reasonable and, and it is going to be taken. I know that I saw some of the other comments. This is not a guarantee. This I know some, and we've heard this in other public meetings that we're just checking the box, that we don't have any intentions to listen to the public. Folks, we, this team uh, and, and myself, we have been across the state, will continue to be across the state. We wanted to make sure that this was an opportunity for people who couldn't attend in person across those many meetings we're having across the state these comments and are valuable to us and it is not a guarantee um i grew up in a small poor county in mora uh where where people's quality of life can't be 
forgotten about the fact that there is New Mexico is a poor state. And in many ways, we can't compare our economic status to our neighboring states or many other states across the country. But we have got some really good and meaningful in, uh, input from people across the state. And Steve and any others uh, on, this, on this presentation, we are really hoping that you all can give us other options to consider because this is not guaranteed. Uh, what we're proposing is not guaranteed. We, we, we need your feedback. So please provide that in writing. Um, we are also taking the measures to post all of this on our website so that everybody sees the comments that are being provided through our web mail uh, that's specific for this. There's, we're, we're taking every transparency approach that we can, we can make on this um, and we need the feedback. And, and so please provide it. Thank you, Toby. Uh, so Paige writes, I feel like on top of the other comments, it's going to cost the state more to enforce non-motorized launch fees that the fees will bring in. How can this be even be effectively enforced? There's already a staff shortage. Who's going to stand at the ramps and be sure that kayakers and SUP users are paid, you, you, SUP users paid their $5? That's, that's a good question, Paige. Um, so we don't stand by and watch uh, at most of our parks, people paying day use fees. Um, we go through and do random checks. Um, currently, our, our officers go out there and do random checks along the shoreline. The way that we see this $5 fee being paid is it's a per vehicle fee. So if you have one truck coming in with two kayaks in it, you would get a pass for that one vehicle, um, put it on the windshield of that vehicle, and as our rangers are going around doing their regular fee verification, they would look at it. It's a regular part of what they do currently. Um, we've received several comments about this. Uh, there may be better options uh, on how to handle this. Um, so please go ahead and continue to send those comments. Um, we're, we're getting a lot of good feedback on this and, and better ways to handle that. We've received some feedback saying that uh, it may be better doing a, an annual pass or a sticker on the, on the kayak or a paddle board or things like that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as fees verification, we do that currently. Um, that's part of what our rangers do, and that would just be part of our normal process. Uh, we're not going to station somebody there at the ramp to watch everything. It's just random checks as we go through about our day. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that. Is that Paige? That, yes. That comment? Paige, thank you for that comment. Um, and, and there's also kind of that balanced discussion of, of, of where we're at. For example, at Elephant Butte Lake State Park, I, I think your home park uh, is Evilness, but um, Evilness has been challenged as well, but I don't have that data on my head right now. But at Evilness, as you may know, we were down to one staff, uh, maybe two between Evilness and Cimarron, and that makes compliance uh, and supporting visitors that much more difficult. Right now at Elephant View, we have a 26% vacancy rate. And so it's hard for us to be able to, to go and, and spend time um, with payment and compliance and, and visitor interactions when we have a quarter of our staff empty. So, you know, it, it, this is part of that discussion is that with some improved funding for the division, we can hire more staff and be more competitive with salaries, which would then in turn provide better visitor services. So thank you for that comment. Thank you, Toby. Uh, CompuGen says, when you say that an already purchased annual camping pass will be honored until it expires, what would be the charge per night in a site with electricity? So right now the annual camping pass covers the base camping rate, which is $10 per night. And visitors that have an annual camping pass pay the utility fee on top of that. Um, we will go ahead and honor the annual camping pass moving forward for the base camping rate, whatever that ends up being. Um, it's proposed right now to be a $20 per night, but they would be responsible for paying the utility fee on top of that just as they are currently. Uh, Maggie W says income slash cost of living is lower in New Mexico. Um, that that we've received that comment in several places. Uh, we've also received several comments about um, income being lower in New Mexico as well. And we appreciate those comments and we'll take those into consideration. So Michael Carney says, OMG, you want to charge $10 per 
day per utility. That's insane. State parks is a is not a profit generating entity. Second highest cost for three nights of camping in the area, but with a statewide median income that is only 66 to 80 percent of those same states. This proposed camping fee wants to make New Mexico the most expensive state to go camping in per household dollar. So our goal is not to make our parks unaffordable. Our goal is to make sure that uh, we generate the revenue that's needed to ensure our state parks are sustainable going forward. As we mentioned, uh, New Mexico State Parks is required by statute to ensure that our facilities are as self-sustaining as possible. So no, we are not trying to be a profit generating entity. We're trying to make sure that we offset all of our costs as much as possible. We realize we're never going to offset all of our costs. We still rely on the general fund for, for a good portion of that. Um, but where we're at currently with the fees that haven't changed in 25 to 40 years, we're not meeting our costs. Um, we're not able to do business with these fees going forward. We have to see some increase and have to make sure that, uh, that we're providing sustainability for our system so that we can maintain and manage these parks long into the future. And Mr. Carney, I, I appreciate that comment. Please provide us what you think is more reasonable. I mean, when this is a, a, a common comment that we've had regarding New Mexico's being a wage wage poor state, um, cost of living, you know, all of that. If you can provide us, it would be very, very helpful for you to provide your perspective on what would be reasonable, knowing that right now our operating budget is in the deficit. So that would be great information for you to share with us, and we we would certainly appreciate your perspective. Uh, Shelly Richard says, are there any considerations for people with disabilities? So I, I'm assuming that you're referring to our current annual camping pass where we offer a, a annual camping pass at a discounted rate for uh, New Mexico residents who are disabled. Uh, the proposal is to do it in all New Mexico camping passes, but we've received uh, significant feedback and comments just like yours um, talking about either maintaining those passes or doing some type of a pass for seniors, people with disabilities, veterans. And that's a comment that, that we're looking at closely. Um, I think we'll we'll look at that and consider that. And like Toby said, if you have recommendations on what you would like to see or how you feel that we could best manage for that, uh, please provide that. Uh, send us an email at that email link and um, we'll be happy to consider those. And Ms. Uh, Shelley, um, I'll just add to that, um, and it's something that we've done in our public meetings uh, that were in person. Um, if you look at the current uh, New Mexico uh, disabled annual camping pass, uh, it's it's $100 for a year. Uh, with our current fee structure, after 10 nights, it's free for the remainder of the year. Uh, that's a really low entry mark for uh, a year pass. So anything that you can provide as far as a strategy to potentially keep the pass, but price it uh, better than it is now. Um, maybe that's something that you can share with us from your perspective that would be happy to, to receive from you. So thank you, Shelly. So CompuJan says many state parks in other states are resort level parks. So comparisons are apples to oranges. Um, our comparisons were, were to other state park systems because we are a state park system. So um, those are the best comparisons we can make. Um, there are some parks that are resort level parks and some park systems have differentiating fees for those. If you uh, think back to the slides or look back to the slides that we had, um, you know, there was in most of those states, they had a range of, of fees. Um, it wasn't just like ours are $10 a night or $8 a night, they ranged from five to fifty dollars a night or fifteen to fifty dollars a night. So um I think that uh, the parks that we looked at um as far as the comparables we showed on the on the reservations we made were pretty comparable to what we offer. And and I'll add to that. So we will never get to resort level if we don't get more support financially. Um well, I will tell you that we are making investments at places like Hyde Memorial State Park. We've implemented yurts which are uh 
a quote unquote kind of glamping option at Coyote Creek State Park. Uh, we're currently building cabins, which will be a very progressive and resort type opportunity at Sugar Eat Canyon State Park. We are in the construction beginning phases of cabins as well up at Lake Maloya. And so we want to improve um, the level of offerings at state parks across the state, but we're in a position where if we build it, we have to manage for it. And um, with a 27% vacancy rate, that makes it tough. And so um, this is Compuon, if you can, um, provide us some of your thoughts on what would be more of an apples to apples for New Mexico rates. We would appreciate that. So Michael Carney says no, none, none for seniors either. Uh, there again, if you have suggestions on how we can implement something, um, please let us know. Paige, I'm all in on understanding the current fee structure doesn't meet current costs and modernization goals, but your benchmark presentations are off. And are you open to people helping you adjust your goals to better meet where people are and where the market is? Because right now you're way off the market. Um, so, as we mentioned, Paige, um, we, we're in this process to gather public comments to gather ideas to better inform our decisions and to ensure that we have the best product going forward so absolutely we are open to people helping providing their comments providing their input and uh, letting us know what you think uh, would be better to adjust our goals CompuJan says to spend one month in New Mexico State Parks in a developed electric site would cost more than $900, including fees for Reserve America, a massive increase and unaffordable for most everyone I know. Uh, Kyle Petri says, I agree, they need to raise rates, but this feels like doing it on the backs of New Mexicans who are already paying via taxes. So, to, to address that, state parks is set up as a user fee, user benefit system. Um, we're an enterprise agency where the user pays to access the, the facility and they benefit from what they're paying for. Um, as we mentioned, we only receive about 25% of our funding from the general fund on an annual basis. Other than that, we are expected to self-generate revenues to support our operations. And in doing so, um, the best way to do that is to have the people that are actually paying or using the facility pay for using that facility. And so Kyle and what was the, the, the one before that? Uh -huh. Kyle and CompuHan, again, if you all can share your thoughts here, we need to hear your perspectives. Um, it, it's important that you all give us some, some alternative options and strategy, excuse me, alternative options and strategies so that this is what this process is for, to better inform us on what your perspectives are, but you have to share and telling us, um, you know, we've heard in other public meetings, this is crazy. Okay, give us better perspective uh, because just telling us you guys are crazy is is not good enough. We need, we need, we really need you all to be sharing what could be an option from your perspectives. So Steve writes, you probably should have had meetings with the public before developing this money grab. I believe you missed a lot of creative opportunities to develop an equitable cost adjustment. So in order for us to enter into a rural revision process, or in order for us to uh, look at amending our fees, we have to come up with a recommendation. Uh, we can't just go out and say, we want to raise our fees and what do you think? Because the answer we're going to get from that is we don't want you to raise your fees. So in order for us to come forward to the public and, uh, and present an idea, we had to do our research. We had to get support from our, our administration. And that's what these meetings are about. We've gone through, we've done our research, we've presented our proposal, made our recommendations. And now we're going to the public and getting your input. 
And then based off of the public input that we receive, we'll make a final determination. As we've stated several times, these recommendations aren't set in stone. Uh, based off the recommendations we receive, based on the public feedback we receive, we'll look at what we have and then adjust from there. But in order for us to go before the public, um, I don't think it'd be very professional of us to come out and not have a recommendation, just to come out and say we need more fees. Um, I don't think you would take us very seriously if we did that. I don't think I will utilize state parks for camping going forward. I will stay to the forest weekend costing $180. I love the state parks, but cost of gas to pull a camper then new cost is not good. Um, you know, we definitely want people to enjoy state parks. We want people to be out in state parks. As we said, this is an ongoing process. We're in the revision process, gathering public comments. Please provide us with your comments and recommendations on what you feel would be reasonable going forward. Also, based on the timeline presented, it feels like they have made the decision already and all of this is just going through the steps. I think we've addressed that several times that uh, this is not just going through the steps. This is a part of our process. We are gathering public comment and considering that comment and taking all of that uh, into advisement on how we go forward. Um, and Kyle, I agree this screams of let's do the bare minimum and not listen to what the public has to say. Um, that's why we're here today. That's why we're traveling across the state is to listen to what the public says. Paige says, Eagle Nest Lakes, my home waters. I love how much care and attention is paid to that. Um, thank you, Paige. Compujan says, will any fee increases be voted on by the legislature and signed into law by the governor, or are these increases not subject to those parts of the state government? You want to administer the vote. So, our, our fees for state parks are set under New Mexico Administrative Code. Uh, pursuant to our statutes, our secretary has the responsibility and the ability to um, promulgate rules under the Ministry of Code and is required to promulgate rules to make sure that state parks are as self-supporting as possible. So our rules process requires that we go through, present our, our recommendations for rule changes, go through our public hearing process, take public comment, and then based off of that, we'll make a final decision with our with our Secretary of Energy, Mineral and Natural Resources Department on how we go forward. Um, they don't go through the legislature. Um, it, it goes through our Secretary's office. Re uh, regarding day use passes, I think this is the biggest mistake to fully remove day use passes. There are many people who live in New Mexico half the year and other states half the year but don't have New Mexico driver's license. So now you're completely cutting these important residents off. Um, thank I'll, you. Go ahead. I'll go ahead. So Paige, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, we know that in Eagle Nest, Cimarron, Taos, their resort communities where it's exactly as you described in your comment. Um, we'd love to hear what a day use pass in that scenario would make sense to you and, and anyone that you're representing. Um, please share that information uh, with us. So Michael says this will be unilateral, though I'm not sure how they plan to do that for the motorboat registration fees since that's under the helm of MVD. So MVD manages, uh, thank you, Michael. M MVD manages the registration process on behalf of state parks. Um, our fee schedule that we, that is determined upon after this process is complete um, would be provided to MVD to make those adjustments on registration fees. Um, so that that's how we would coordinate with another state agency in order for these registration fees to be implemented by them on our behalf, which is currently how that happens. I will also say that all revenue generated from registration fees is reverted to the state parks division and every dollar from that registration fee is matched to a federal dollar uh, so we leverage every dollar to another dollar in support of the voting safety education and enforcement program that is statewide as part of the vote act. Thank you. Dewey. 
Uh, Michael also asked, how will the public comments be addressed and weighed in the process? Assessed, yeah. Assessed and weighed in the process. We're going to receive them all and go through them all. We're, we're already uh, in between meetings. We're already reviewing that those comments. We're getting some great, great comments, good strategies, good options for us to consider to amend what we provided. Steve, I'm sorry you think this is lip service. I'm a seven generation New Mexican born in one of the poorest counties and raised there. Um, this is not lip service from me, sir. I, I hope that you you can appreciate our position as an enterprise agency. Um, we are going to do our very best to uh, incorporate what the public has for us. And those of you who use it day in and day out, those of you who live in those communities because the state park exists there, um, this is not lip service. But we certainly value that you all can give us good information to consider because that's what we're going to do. We're going to take it into consideration and uh, manage accordingly. Okay, so Paige says, I really appreciate the information, the access to absorbing it, absorbing it after the fact. Mickey says, existing length of stay rules are not being enforced. I have traveled to many New Mexico's parks that have campers who live there based on the site conditions. After 14 days, rules state they must vacate for a week. Enforcement is key here. Yes, Vicki, we agree that uh, enforcement is critical. Um, we we are doing our best to make sure that we enforce that 14 day stay rule. Um, our rule says they have to, that you can stay in the New Mexico State Park uh, 14 days out of any 20 day period. Um, unfortunately, with staffing levels, sometimes that's hard to catch. Um, but we are managing for that um, as best we can. And hopefully as we hire on more staff, we're able to better manage for that. And Vicki, I'll add to that, just, just for some background information for everyone uh, on this call, on this presentation, um, eight, we have approximately 80 positions that are law enforcement positions spread out across the system. And right now, 42% of those positions are vacant. We are actively recruiting around the state um, I'd like to ask all of you if there's anyone you know who's interested in working for New Mexico State Parks, we'd love to have them apply. Uh, but 42% of our law enforcement positions are vacant across the system. And as you all know, law enforcement positions across our state are highly competitive. Um, they're, they're from state police to uh, city, municipalities, counties. We are all struggling to fill our law enforcement positions and state parks is right in the middle of that as well. So we're, we're, we're recruiting across the state. If you know of anyone, please have them uh, express their interest for, for employment as a law enforcement ranger uh, out in, in the system. Okay. Uh, Paige says, I have an annual Texas State Parks Pass and it's per vehicle. Uh, thank you for that, Paige. Brenda says, Texas offers 50% discount for seniors. Many of our seniors are on fixed incomes and want to be able to afford the new fees. Um, there again, we encourage you to make recommendations on on how you feel we can better serve the seniors, um, what what you would like to see there. Howard says, triple the camping fee per night. Please do it incrementally. We camp state parks in Texas, Colorado, and Oklahoma, and none of the charge the fee for dumping. Let me answer that one real quick or provide some feedback. So, Howard, thank you. That's a comment that we've heard about doing it incrementally. And, and I just want everybody to understand, we haven't been asleep on the wheel here uh, with our fees. Uh, I've been with the division over 25 years throughout different administrations. We have tried uh, and, and made requests to get the support to incrementally increase our fees. Unfortunately, that has not happened over those years. And we fully understand that trying to catch up right now is a huge jump. And so, Howard, um, if you can share some of your your thoughts on what you think would be a reasonable, reasonable incremental timeline, that would be very beneficial for us to have as well. Uh, Shelly asked, will there be a pass for those with, with disabilities? Um, I think we've answered that a couple of different times on here. Um, currently, we're proposing doing away with the annual camping pass, but uh, if you have recommendations on how we can better meet the needs of those folks, please provide us with those recommendations. And, uh, and just uh, Shelly on that on that discussion, I think if I got the data correct, we, we average just below 200 annual camping passes for New Mexico disabled residents. 
Um, it's a hundred dollar fee for a year. Again, that's 10 nights. And then after that, everything is, um, uh, is, is pretty much paid for. Please share us, share your thoughts with us on that. We, we want to know different, uh, opportunities or options and perspectives that you all may have on that. Paige says, I appreciate the differentiation between the annual day use passes versus annual camping passes. In other states that have been trying to manage reservation systems, the camping pass situation is difficult. Texas is still trying to figure that out, but annual day use should still be available. Thank you, Paige. Um, you know, that, that's one of the issues that we're having with the annual camping passes. It's difficult for us to manage and allow it to be used for our reservation system. Um, right now, um, in order to manage for that, um, it, in order to manage for it more effectively, we would have to have all of our annual camping passes sold through our reservation system. So you wouldn't be able to buy it at a park anymore. You would have to go online to the reservation system and purchase it that way. Um, it, it makes it very difficult whenever you have two different systems operating there. Um, we are in the process currently of, uh, or coming up going through a request for proposals for our contract for our reservation systems. And hopefully, as we do that, we can find a better way to manage for that. Brenda, these increased fees will cause folks to go to the forest and trash it worse than it already is. Um, as we mentioned, our goal is not to increase fees to the point where people don't utilize parks. Our goal is to make sure that um, folks are still able to utilize parks, but that we're able to maintain operations and pay for operating costs that we need to make sure the parks stay open. And I'll just add to that. I think that that comment, Brenda, thank you for it, uh, really outlines a very stark difference in what you can expect to receive on, on those properties where there's not a management uh, model for day-to-day -day operations and administration compared to state parks. And so we're, we're looking for your feedback to help us improve our position so we can continue to facilitate that so that state parks don't look uh, the way some of those federal properties do that don't have day-to-day -day management. Paige says, I worry that raising the dumping fees will cause people to dump illegal illegally on the roadside and rivers. Um, yeah, I, I'll, thank you. That's a great comment. It's something that I'm very passionate about as well, Paige. Unfortunately, in our state, we don't have enough dump stations spread out in our highways and byways. We do a great job of inviting uh, people to New Mexico and encouraging New Mexicans to get out and enjoy their outdoors. But as a state, we are failing to provide the infrastructure needed for RVers and campers and overnight uh, uh, recreationists, the opportunity to get rid of their solid waste and their liquid waste in a responsible way. Right now, state parks leads in our state uh, as far as a public agency in providing for solid waste and uh, RV liquid waste, both black and gray water, high concentration uh, RV waste is what it's considered um, by providing 23 dumping stations across the system. That's not enough for our state. And so we agree with you that uh, the irresponsible uh, disposition of, of waste is a, is a concern. And we don't necessarily want to defer people from using them in state parks but the last uh, dump station that we built at uh, Story Lake State Park, which is on a major byway for national uh, force access, um, cost right at about a half a million dollars. And those, in, those dump stations continue to be increasing in cost primarily because of the environmental requirements that they need to meet. But we agree with you, we don't want to, to disrupt the opportunities, but we actually need to recover some of uh, of our cost in, in making sure that we can maintain, operate, and build new dump stations across the system. Hey, Jess, can we show a utility bill or a property tax bill instead of a registered vehicle to show residency? That would be a good ad. Um, currently, the way that we have it drafted, it's a, a New Mexico license or a New Mexico vehicle registration, but um, thank you for those comments. We can, we can consider how we do that going forward. 
Uh, Paige says, also, I love and appreciate that you have an ASL translator. Thank you, Paige. Uh, Sergeant Evie McKay says, will this meeting be recorded and posted for playback? I would very much appreciate the continuing reference. Yes, this meeting is recorded and we will post it for access later on. Uh, Michael says, regarding the argument for parity for power craft fees, the fee study uses a single decade old survey and even goes as far as citing private water access fees on the other side of the country in an attempt to make this argument. Actual parity of state park systems in our region is zero. There are no launch fees in Arizona, Utah, Colorado, or Texas state parks. We, we um, thank you, that, uh, Sergeant, thank you for your service. Um, we actually have data on launch fees. There's launch fees across the system. I don't have that data in front of me, but um, we will uh, follow up on that as far as, as launch fees go. I know that states like uh, just off the top of my head, Idaho and others have implemented uh, launch fees. We'll have to verify. Uh, I'll have to look back at our data set that was part of the fee study to determine what Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and Texas uh, are doing with launch fees, uh, whether or not they're incorporated in another way. So we will definitely sharpen our pencil on whether or not um, that data is accurate or if we need to uh, incorporate it into our current data set. Hello, my name is Shelly Richard with the Doniana Village Association. We are very concerned about outdoor equity for people with disabilities, as well as low income folks. Eliminating day use fees will help with outdoor equity during the day. However, the drastic increase in camping fees may eliminate the use, uh, the use of low income people from camping. Would you consider a pass for low income people that qualify for public assistance? Um, I, I think that's a, that's a, a good recommendation. Um, I'm not sure how we would do that, but, um. You know, that's a comment we can we can consider going forward. Um, Paige says, I'm excited to send you what's reasonable. Um, wanted to attend this meeting and listen before writing. Thank you for holding these meetings. Thank you, Paige. Kyle says, thank you. It's appreciated that you're listening. Thank you, Kyle. Steve says, I will spend the time to provide quality comments. How do I know you will actually listen? Um, Steve, I guarantee you um, all the comments that we receive go to my email address. And as they come in, I'm reading them. Um, I'm visiting with several folks a day. Uh, my phone number is posted on the website. Um, we are listening. Um, if we weren't, we wouldn't be holding these meetings. Uh, we would just go forward and do what we were doing. But it's very important to us that we gather public input. That's why uh, we're spending this month and part of March, traveling around the state, meeting with people and gathering the input. Maggie W, yes, thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Vicki, stair step increases over a three to five year period. Um, I think Toby's uh, discussed incremental increases already and answered that question. Thank you for that comment, Vicki. Um, Wendy, our marketing manager says the public's encouraged to provide comments. On the New Mexico State Park fee study rule changes, written comments will be received until March 29th. Fees will not change until Jan July 1st. Uh, just a clarification there. Um, they may not even change July 1st if we don't uh, make amendments to it, if this process shows that we need to change what we've pr proposed. So July 1st is our goal date. There's no guarantee that July 1st is actually going to be the date. You can mail comments to um, that address there, um, the email address, um, I will post in here, but it's on our website as well. She probably provided. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Michael, for providing that on there. Uh, Paige, yes, I think different ways to handle annual passes will help y'all manage things. Honestly, I think with the current fee system, uh, are too hard to manage compliance in the canyon and at the lake. It's too easy for people to skip paying or cheat the system. And that's another part of what our fee study looked at was better ways to how we manage collecting fees, uh, better ways to ensure that we're more efficient and are doing these things in the best way possible. 
page. I want state parks to get more money to hire more staff and make improvements, but I don't think the current proposal is a silver bullet. I will email directly with more thoughts after hearing your thoughts in this meeting. Thank you, Paige. Kathy, why not do this incrementally? These are huge increases to make all at once. Um, I think we've we've answered that question already. So we're getting some duplicate questions. Um, we're gonna skip over those. Okay, folks, please keep in mind to also contact your local state reps regarding these changes, but also to forward your comments and ideas to state parks. You can contact your New Mexico governor. Uh, thank you, Sergeant McKay. Vicky, 2023, New Mexico has an expected $3.5 billion surplus. Maybe the state needs to share some of that surplus with the parks department. Yeah, and Vicki, thank you for that comment. We've received that at many of the public meetings. And I can tell you that from our perspective, our requests for additional funding have been as aggressive now as ever before. And so um, I can assure you that the State Parks Division is taking uh, every opportunity to request more support. And in our FY25 request, we received about $1.7 million more in operational support. Um, and uh, where we did get a tremendous support from the legislature and the administration was in capital funding, one-time money that has to go into capital assets and improvements. Uh, we asked for 10 million, which we've never asked for that much before. And they actually awarded us with 16 million. Um, and part of that is because we've done such a really good, uh, such a great job in expending the ARPA money. We got $20 million in ARPA money um, a year and a half ago, and we've already spent over 15 and a half of that or obligated for expenditure. And so um, I appreciate your comment. And, and just from our perspective, know that we are uh, aggressively seeking out additional financial support. Michael says, between this presentation, the Sunshine Portal and the executive budget for 2024, all three have wildly different numbers, 14 million to 42 million. Depending on the source, can you please provide a direct link to the budget sources used in this presentation? So the information for the budget presentation that I put up there um, comes off of the Sunshine Portal. Um, let me see if I can, I think I can here, just real quickly. Um, So I am sharing um, my screen showing the Sunshine Portal. This is where we gathered the information from for that budget. Um, and what we did was we pulled um, the approved budget. If you look at the executive agency, you can drill down and go to the different departments. Um, that's where we pulled the department information from. Um, if you have further questions, uh, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call and I can walk you through it. But uh, the Sunshine Portal is where we pulled all the information from because we wanted folks to be able to look it up themselves as well. Uh, system modernization is going to be important. What are the state parks plans for modernization? You'll mention maybe your sticker system for watercraft, et cetera, tell us more. The paper folders and entry points is way too easy to cheat and too hard to track. Uh, we absolutely agree with that. Um, let me just comment on that. Paige. Yes, Paige, thank you. We, we agree the current Iron, Iron Ranger system is antiquated. Um, it's difficult to track. It's easy to cheat. Um, we are currently in the process of moving towards kiosk systems um, where whenever you go in, you can go and um, go to a kiosk look at what reservations are available in a campground, look at what campsites are available, pay for your day use fee, do it all with your card and do it that way. Um, the issue that we've run into, we've received some proposals from uh, kiosk vendors, but the issue we've run into is that those kiosks don't tie to our reservation system currently. So as I mentioned earlier, we're doing a new request for proposals. Our reservation system contract ends in November. Through that request for proposals, um, through that new contract, we're making sure that uh, kiosks and the ability for kiosks to tie to that reservation system are a part of that. And that is our goal moving forward to ensure that 
all of our parks have a, a automated kiosk that somebody can come into and use that for their stay. Jared, can I add to that? Yes. Um, thank you. You are on page, right? The modernization. Sorry, I had to take a quick bathroom break. Um, but I'm back. Paige, thank you for that. Let me give you another perspective. Um, out of the 35 state parks, uh, and this was as of this year, uh, last year into this year, 28 of the 35 state parks were not able to function uh, on connectivity with internet connectivity. Um, 28 were operating at or less than three megabytes per second. Um, in many of those parks, they couldn't maintain connection with the network. And in some of those parks, they couldn't even send an email, like up at Sugar Eat Canyon State Park, they were that challenged with connectivity. So I really do appreciate your modernization discussion because part of what we have committed to now, uh, because these rural areas aren't getting ISPs and many of you live in rural areas, I, I know that you all are under the same struggles. We're having to transition to satellite connectivity. And so we've engaged Starlink, which is uh, the Elon Musk uh, opportunity uh, for satellite connections, but as we're implementing those to improve our modernization in parks, we we hope that everybody understands starting doesn't come cheap, especially not with a government rate. And so that's one of those modernization efforts that we're moving towards, but we also need the recurring funding to make sure that we can maintain it. And so we are we're we're looking at. Did you talk about kiosks? Yes. Okay, you talk about kiosks. But just another uh, reason for for folks to realize. We're not asleep at the wheel here. We're trying to make those improvements and um, modernization comes in different ways and, and we, we certainly have them on the radar. Thank you. Sergeant McKay says disability no nor for VA or elderly retired submit your suggestions or regarding this. Um, yes, please submit suggestions on on how you would like to see us address that. Um, we're, we're looking forward to receiving those comments and those suggestions. And we've received several several of those already. New Mexico's annual days passes are half of what neighboring states charge, so I encourage an annual pass fee increase to match, on average, eighty dollars a year with a discount for residents. Uh, but I don't think you should eliminate them. Thank you, Paige. That's a good comment. Michael, uh, regarding the paddlecraft user fee, was there any consideration given to the fact that such a fee is unconstitutional? The New Mexico Constitution upheld by multiple New Mexico Supreme Court cases include as recently as two years ago. Today, March 1st, 2022 grants the public the right to use the waters of the state. If an individual can access the water legally, they may flow paddle that water even through private lands, much, much less state parks. Paddlers in New Mexico take our access rights seriously. We have a proven track record of not backing down on this issue and winning. My recommendation is to drop this idea completely. It will not hold up. Thank you for that comment. Um, our, our legal counsel has reviewed what the proposal is. Uh, we can double back with them on that topic uh, to ensure that we're not encroaching on something that would be unconstitutional. So, so thank you for that. And, and we're not trying to create a divide with paddlecraft. We, we want to work with Paddlecraft and provide better services to, to Paddlecraft users. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not trying to to, to create an adversarial us versus Paddlecraft users. In fact, we embrace Paddlecraft. Um, we're just trying to improve a user pay user benefit option, but we will we will definitely take that comment back to our general counsel uh, to verify. Maggie says, if there is time and if we get to it, can I unmute for a couple of comments? Yes, as soon as I get to the end of the chat comments, then we'll unmute. Hopefully we have time for that. Uh, seems like we're still getting in chat comments. Uh, Michael says, I'm not sure how long the fee study took to write by someone being paid to do it, but it will take us some time to take in this information and comments and come up with alternate recommendations in our own spare uh, spare time. Um, so, our fee study has been going on for quite some time. Uh, this iteration of it, we started back in January and uh, we completed it in July. Um, and now we're moving on to the public comment section. So I understand it's a lot to take in and we appreciate you looking at it and providing your comments. And that was January and July of 2023. Right. How much time do we have before the fee structure is set in stone? So we really don't have an answer as far as 
when the fee structure will be set in stone. As we've mentioned, this is a this is our public comment period during our rule revision process. Um, we have our public comment period. We'll take all those comments into consideration. We'll have our rules hearing on April 1st, and then after that, make a decision on where we go from there. So it could be that we adopt it. It could be that we make additional changes. It could be that we go back out for another public comment period and go go down that path. So um, I can't tell you um, how long we have before the fee structure is set in stone. Um, because I, it's not set in stone. It, right, it is not set in stone. A flat rate of twenty dollars a night is a great idea. This is from Mark, uh, but tacking on ten dollars here and there is not. Why a five dollar fee to launch a canoe? Why make it free for residents? Increase fees to ten dollars a car yearly day pass to a hundred, and so on. We are a poor state, Texas state parks. You don't get a fishing license from shore. So um, New Mexico, um, Texas state parks is. Their game and fish and parks are one agency. In New Mexico, uh, we're two different agencies. State parks manages the recreation in our park areas. Game and fish manages for uh, fishing and hunting and those rules. So there's really no way for us to adjust that. Um, we're, we're two separate entities. Uh, thank you for your comments on, on different proposals for how to adjust fees. Uh, page LOL. It took me about 15 minutes to find out that New Mexico current proposal is in benchmarking with most other states. I don't know who they paid, but I'd like to get paid to help next time. So um, the the information that we provided, we looked at uh, information that came from the National Association of State Parks Directors. Um, every year they do a fee uh, study and look at all the state park systems across the state. That information is provided on our website. Um, it's listed as the technical information that we use. So you're welcome to go there and look at that technical information. Um, again, this study was completed in July of 2023. So if other states have changed their fees since then, there may be some differences there. Michael and Steve, they wanna set our rules on April 1st and begin new fees July 1st. So exactly one month from today, that's not correct. Um, as we said, um, there is no date set in stone. This is the process. CompuJan says many Colorado state parks have concrete pads, their campsites, level sites, totally paved roads throughout, laundromats and more. Um, thank you for that. Uh, many of our campsites have concrete pads and level sites and paved roads as well. Um, and we are working continuously to improve our campgrounds. Vicki says, okay, so my suggestion would be to use the COL rates applicable to New Mexico and make increases based on incremental levels. I run some numbers and email it to you. Thank you for that. We'll look forward to that email. Eileen Everett says, thank you for a very informative presentation. I've submitted my comments to MNRD Parks Providence. I encourage everyone else to submit their comments including ideas of what specifically to change by March 29th. In case anyone needs it, this website has so much helpful information, including the presentation shared today. Thank you for that. Paige says, thank you for hearing. Our family has property here since the 30s, and this is our heart home. These changes were quite shocking. I provided more specific thoughts and other comments and plan to write an email directly uh, with some suggestions that are hopefully helpful. Thank you for that page. Steve Harrington says, I hope it is and I'll be in touch, have some decent ideas. Thank you for that, Steve. CompuJan says, to be clear, I don't wish to stay in a resort style state park, nor do I wish to pay the fees for that type of camping. Thank you, CompuJan. Uh, Chris Bisman says, please post a link to apply for jobs here. Um, if that's not posted by the end here, I will uh, do that. Uh, Chris says, love the offer the SL feature. Thank you for that. Um, Steve says, just curious, do you folks making these fee schedules pay the same fees as the rest of us do? Yes, we do. Uh, when we go out to state parks, we pay the same fees. Sergeant McKay says, yes, New Mexico has only been tourist friendly, but not traveler friendly. Um, 
Thank you for that comment. If you would like to expand, please send us an email with uh, further explanation there. Um, Chris says, can there be verification of local status by utility or property tax bill for those of us that are our by state ISL? I cannot surrender my license in uh, my second state, and we're legally not allowed to have a driver's license in more than one state. Uh, for by state residents, is there a very, this is very difficult catch. Um, so thank you for that comment. I think that was made a little bit earlier and um, we will revisit and consider those comments and see what the best way is to verify residency status. Steve Harrington says, making pay for dump fees is going to end up with crap everywhere. Um, count on it. Some people just don't care if you charge $10, it won't get used. Um, I think we've addressed that comment already. So thank you for that comment. Uh, Sergeant McKay agree paying for benchmarking a friend who was looking at applying to NMLEO open applications says New Mexico is offering way less in pay versus other states. Um, yes, uh, New Mexico, our pay is a bit lower than other states and we're hoping to correct that uh, with our current or our most recent um, reclassification. reclassification. Um, we have a better pay scale and uh, we need the budget to go along and support that pay scale. So that's part of the reason for doing that. Paige says, I'm dying who, to know who you paid for benchmarking because the fee proposal doesn't meet with neighboring states at all. Um, there again, this fee study was done internally. Uh, we used information provided from uh, other states' websites. We used information from the, new, the National Association of State Parks Directors, and that information was compiled internally. Sergeant McKay says that's okay. No local economic impact study or income studies were done either. So in regards to economic impact, um, through our rules hearing revision process, we coordinate with the New Mexico Economic Development Department. Um, they have their small business development uh, council and we provide our rule changes to them for them to give input and provide recommendations on whether it will have um, economic impact for small businesses across the state. Uh, we rely on them to, to provide that information for us. And we're awaiting feedback. And we are, yes, we are awaiting feedback on that. Paige, love to hear the question about can people with utility assistance get additional access discounts? This is the sector I work in regularly, and it's a good question to explore when thinking about equity. Um, thank you, Paige. Stephen says, hello, my name is Stephen. How will this proposed fee structure affect houseboat owners with slips and mooring balls at Navajo Lake and Elephant Butte Lake, entrance fees, camping fees, et cetera? Thank you. Yeah, so, you know, much of this structure will remain in its application as it is currently applied. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, access to uh, certain concessions across the state are part of their concession contract with that provider up at Navajo Dam Enterprise. Navajo Dam Enterprises would be at Navajo Lake, Marino del Sur down at Elephant Butte, um, as well as the Rock Canyon Service Center. And so that will be an integration of uh, any new fees would, would be applicable to how they're being applied under the current fee schedule. Thank you, Toby. Um, Paige says, can I still get annual passes until so currently we're not changing our operations. Anything we're selling now, we're going to continue to sell until we make our final recommendations. And like we said, um, that date is up in the air until we get through this process. Sergeant McKay says at this time, end of June, um, there again, it depends on how this process goes. Michael said, I looked through the Sunshine Portal during the meeting and could not find the numbers matching those used in the presentation. Um, that, that's where we pulled the information from. Um, if you would like, you're welcome to give me a call and I can walk you through that or shoot me an email and I can provide you with links to those. 
Um, William says many permanently disabled residents and the elderly are on fixed income. I know that I will not be able to afford to stay in the state parks anymore unless some relief annual passes with discounted daily rates is provided. Um, so we received several comments on that. And there again, please email us your comments with what your recommendations are that you feel would be helpful for addressing those. Uh, Sergeant McKay says, get rid of Reserve America for reservations and go in house reservation system. So, while some states do have in house reservation systems, we don't have the capability to do that. If you think back to the slide where we talked about, we have 190 positions in state parks. Only 27 of those are administrative positions in our Santa Fe office. To run a 24 hour reservation system, and maintain that would take several positions that we don't have. Uh, we feel a better use of our positions is to have them out in the field, um, providing visitor service out where the visitors are at. And that's why we contract with, uh, with different reservation systems. And as we mentioned, we're in the RFP process or we'll be in the RFP process fairly quickly to uh, update our reservation contract. I would be willing to pay $300 for an annual pass and $10 per day for hookups. Thank you for that comment, William. William, thank you. That, that's, that's the kind of suggestions, uh, strategies that we, we will appreciate and be of great value. Paige says, Starlink is expensive, but I get it. Also, you need to be connected with vendors who specialize in connectivity. I can have that conversation. And I know in places like Cimarron Canyon, there's no signal. It's a problem that can be solved definitely, of course, with some money. Thank, um, you, Paige. thank you for that comment, Paige. Steve says, are you prepared for all the food people will dump in our rivers and creeks? When you start charging $10 for a dump, you may want to rethink that idea. You think I'm kidding, just go up to the Hemis or Pecos and take a hike. Um, I think we've addressed that comment already. Sergeant McKay says, personally, I want to thank you, Paige, for your input. You have picked up on a number of things that I've been missing. It will help with my submission. Thank you for that. Um, Wendy posted our link to the state personnel website. That's where all of our um, all of our job positions are posted at. Maggie says it looks like the chat comments will continue to come. So I have written specific suggestions submitted both to New Mexico State Parks and Governor. I may do so again. Thank you for that, Maggie. Um, I linked the RV park to show that with proposed changes, New Mexico State Park site with electric and water will be $40 and private park literally next door will be $25. Um, I've been on both sides of this as an ACP holder and a host. I see how overworked rangers are. I see declining infrastructure. I want these to get fixed. I think we can do this without doubling the camping fee, overshooting inflation numbers and cost of living levels in New Mexico. Thank you for actively soliciting and listening to input. Um, thank you, Maggie. Steve says, thank you for doing your best at being transparent. It's got to be hard sitting in the hot seat. <laughs> best wishes, email to follow. Thank you, Steve. Um, I, I appreciate everyone's input and everyone's comment. Um, obviously, you know, we've put a lot of thought in this. We've put a lot of work into trying to make our recommendations, but we don't know everything and we rely on public input to better inform us. So thank you all for participating in the process. CompuJazz says, thank you for running a respectful meeting and for carefully answering our questions and addressing our comments. Thank you for that. Uh, Paige says, the person asking about calling instead of texting may be having accessibility issues. So I hope there's time to hear them. Um, that was me. Uh, that was Maggie. And I think she provided her comments there. So um, hopefully if she's still on, we can get to uh, to that as well. Uh, Sergeant McKay says, thank you folks once again. Hopefully y'all are getting a little less torpedoed on your public meetings. Elephant View was constructive, but very emotionally by many. And, and we understand that. Um, you know, something that, that I've tried to express at these public meetings is this is emotional for us too. Um, folks don't work for New Mexico State Parks for glory. Folks don't work for New Mexico State Parks for the money. We work here because we love the resource. We all go out there. We all go camping. We all, um, this is this is what we're passionate about. And this is what we've chosen to do with our life. So we understand the emotion. 
Um, we understand people are passionate about it and we appreciate that. So thank you for that comment. And I'll just add to that uh, and I'll make it quick because I know we're long here. I, I appreciate that comment and primarily because we know this conversation is long overdue and we're glad to be having it with all of you. And it's it's important to us. My, my family and many of our families have moved across the state as part of my career. And I was lucky enough to have kids and, and, and my spouse who were willing to do that with me. And so this means more to me than just my eight to five. And many of our staff, if not all of our staff, have a similar affiliation with their work. So I, I appreciate those comments because it, it does mean a lot to us. So Maggie, I think we are at the end of the comments here. Let me see how I can unmute you. Give me just one second here. So Maggie, I clicked request to unmute. Go ahead and try and unmute yourself. You should be unlocked. Hello? Hello? There you You're on, we can hear you. Hi. So again, thank you very much. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to speak, um, to ask questions and to get really thoughtful answers. I really appreciate it. I wanted to comment because I am coming at this from both sides. I've been a long time annual camping pass holder. I do spend a good chunk of time in parks, especially in the winter time, but I also travel to a lot of other places. Um, I've written with specific things, but I will say that I would pay triple the amount I'm paying for an annual pass with limited time in the parks, because like I said, I'm not here all year. And I think that would that kind of limitation, that kind of targeted change would address a lot of problems. I've been on the other side of it. I've been hosting and dealing with campers and some of the issues that come up with the annual pass. I get it. I appreciate it. Like, I, you know, I'm in a park where a restroom doesn't work. I want it to work. I want the roads to be good. I want the rangers to be staffed. I want them to be paid reasonably well. I want all of this stuff to work out. Um, the annual pass is unusual. It's not unique. I think it's wonderful. I think it's just a, a, a spectacular feature of the New York State Parks, and I would really like us to find a way to keep it. One other thing that I'm noticing today is there's some kind of an event, and there's a bunch of campers here who have towed a bunch of flatbeds in with various vehicles, and um, I'm realizing that they're not paying fees for all of those vehicles, even though they're tooling around the parks in them. Um, they're paying their regular fee, but all the stuff that's getting towed in here and that are then driving around are not paying fees. I'm wondering if there are some other ways that we can look at the, the fee issue and the revenue issue. Also, it seems like a lot of the problems that you guys are talking about are specific to the biggest parks. There are probably ways to, again, take targeted approaches attack the problems where they're happening. Um, I, so again, I've written some details. Uh, I just wanted to put that out there again. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Maggie. We appreciate that. And that that's that's constructive feedback that we, we need. And um, I, I think that's great. All right. Um, so we have a couple more comments here. Paige says, I really resonate with the conversation about trash. I go to many forest service locations that are so trash and we spend more time cleaning than enjoying. There has to be a solution. Thank you for that comment, Paige. Uh, Sergeant McKay says, indeed. Paige says, thank you. The elimination of the annual days passes at the answer. Thank you. And Paige says, camping pass, yes, maybe get rid of that. But annual day pass really meets a lot of people's needs in and out of the state. Um, I think that is the end of our chat questions. Are there any other folks that would like to unmute and make a comment, or is there anyone else that a quick comment has yeah. any other questions? Um, just you'll need to raise your hand, and we can unmute you. Okay. I'm not seeing any on there. Are you, Mish? Okay. Well, um, 
again, we appreciate all of the feedback. We appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to join us and to go over this and listen to what we're proposing. Um, thank you all for, for your great comments. Again, please do go ahead and go in and uh, email us, uh, write us and provide uh, your, your comments and feedback. And uh, we look forward to, to going through this process moving forward. Thank you all on behalf of New Mexico State Parks and the Energy, Minerals and Natural Resources Department. Uh, we're, we're committed to doing better through your input and we appreciate you spending uh, almost two and a half hours with us on a Friday afternoon. And uh, thank you to our ASL uh, team. They have done a wonderful job on our behalf. Thank you so much. You're such a, a great resource for all of New Mexico. And have a good Friday and happy weekend. And um, thank you again. Thank you.